ABB versus Fanuk versus Yaskawa. If you're familiar with at least one of these names, then you probably have an idea of what this is all about. So these three firms are leading manufacturers of industrial robotic solutions, like the ones that you see in the picture here. So uh, this slide from Yaskawa shows the type of industrial robotic solutions that we're going to talk about and that we're looking to invest in. So here you can see the product lineup across the top. You have arc welding, spot welding, and paint. Those are primarily for automotive applications. And Yaskawa actually 40% of their robotics revenues come from automotive, which happens to be a leading application for industrial robotics. This chart here is rather old, the one in the middle, but it shows the breakdown of industrial robotics by industry, and that probably somewhat mimics what you see today. So you can see that electronics and automotive are highly automated, accounting for around 60% of industrial robotics installs. The chart on the right shows penetration. So the societies where robots are doing a lot of the work, and then on the left-hand side there, you can see sort of the number of uh, industrial robots that are deployed. If you think about the total addressable market, there's a lot of different opportunities. For example, this is a piece that we published about four years ago, and this was um, research that we had conducted in the um, Columbia River Gorge in regards to fruit packing and how fruit packing warehouses use technology, and this particular corporation had lost a warehouse and then rebuilt it entirely from scratch using automation. You can see here that they have six industrial robots there stacking pallets of fruit based on size and other factors. And this is the warehouse automation thesis, which we've already made an investment in with a particular stock. And now we're looking to supplement a robotics exposure with some industrial robotics. So Figuring out the total addressable market here is rather difficult. We can start at the very top, which would be global manufacturing industry output, which is somewhere around $42 trillion in 2021. So if we assume that most manufacturing could be conducted by industrial robotics, then that's a pretty big opportunity. Now today, China accounts for more than half of all new robotics installations, and ABB, a player that we're going to discuss today, expects the global robotics market to grow from around $80 billion today to $130 billion in several years. So that's quite rapid growth. But what's interesting is that the three firms that we're going to talk about today, which are arguably the biggest, and you might throw in uh, Mitsubishi, which is a conglomerate as a player in the top five, and perhaps KUKA, which was acquired, I believe, by a Chinese firm uh, that was used to be a German firm. Uh, those also would be considered major players. But if we're just going to talk about the big three, then over the past trailing 12 months, they brought in a collective $43 billion. So the market is, let's say, it's not early days. So it's, it's sort of in the middle of maturity. But our thesis really is that if you look at global manufacturing and the total penetration of, for example, warehouse robotics is very, very small. So the total opportunity is massive, and we're looking to invest in firms that can take advantage of that. So when we look at ABB, Fanuk, and Yaskawa, uh, two of these firms, the latter two are from Japan, and ABB is a Swiss firm. You can see in terms of size that ABB is the largest, and of course in revenues, they're larger as well. The SVR there, that stands for simple valuation ratio. That's just a way we use here at Nanalyze to value companies. It's market cap divided by annualized revenues. Now, when we look at these big three firms, what we're primarily interested in is the exposure that we're getting to industrial robotics. So if you've been following this series of videos or articles, and by the way, there's a very comprehensive research piece that was used to produce this video that goes into a whole lot more detail than what I'm going to talk about today. I'll put a link to that in the description of this video. But if you've been following this series of articles, 
we're looking to replace in our portfolio Teradyne, which is a company that we had invested in to get industrial robotics exposure. That's not happening, nor is it expected to happen if we listen to what management says. So when we look at ABB, we actually see a similar situation. Here we've broken down their last quarter in terms of where their revenues are coming from. You can see electrification, 46%. That's appealing, of course, but we're not looking for exposure to electrification. We want exposure to robotics, which only accounts for around 11% of their total revenues. The chart below there, you see the red line shows the uh, year over year growth on a quarterly basis. And you can see that still they're well under a billion dollars in revenues. It's just a small percentage of what they do. And we're not getting the exposure that we're looking for there, though it's a decent company. And there's certainly uh, there's certainly characteristics of ABB that we find appealing, but it's not what we're looking for. Now, when we look at Yaskawa, this is the breakdown of their divisions. And uh, if we go back real quick and look at ABB, we can see Motion accounting for 23% of total revenues. Well, Motion, what's referred to here as Motion Control, accounts for f almost half of Yaskawa's revenue. So you're getting that exposure. And then you can see robotics is around 37%. That, that floats between 37 and 40%, very similar to what we see with Fanuc. And here you can see how Fanuc's revenues coming from industrial robotics are growing consistently over time, but also commanding around 40%. The average of these numbers is actually 38%. So let's say around 40% of total revenues. That's some pretty good exposure. Then you have to look at, well, what else am I getting exposure to? And one area that they operate in is what they call robo machines, perhaps a bit misleading. So these are more or less manufacturing machines that do a number of different things. And whilst they might have elements of automation about them, they don't really fall under the category of the sort of industrial robotic solutions that we're looking to invest in, but there's a certain appeal to that. And the question there is, well, if you're one of these companies, what's the overlap between your industrial robotics division and the other divisions? Because that allows you to cross sell more effectively. And I would say for Fanuc, their overlap seems quite good as does uh, uh, for Yaskawa. Now, when we look at the industrial robotics exposure for all three of these companies, this took a while to produce. We had to go into their individual PDFs and extract this information, but it paints a pretty nice picture when we look at what these firms have brought in over the past what is this? About 11 quarters here that we're looking at the industrial robotics exposure that they offer. We can see uh, Fanuc leads there. And uh, in, you'll have to read the article to see what conclusions we reach in regards to which of these firms that we found the most appealing. Now, I wanted to kind of throw a counterpoint out here, which is rather interesting. So let's talk for a second about Toyota. Toyota happens to be a Japanese firm. They're uh, one of the leading automotive manufacturers in the world. Here you can see how they've, uh, in the most recent years, led the charge in terms of global new car sales. And you can ask just about anybody that drives Toyota or knows anything about vehicles. They're perhaps the most reliable vehicle on this planet, bar none. So this is a picture taken from a rather funny video on YouTube by a gentleman called Whistling Diesel. And what he did is he bought himself a 1989 Helix here. They don't produce these in the States anymore, but he got himself one. And then he proce proceeded to abuse the hell out of it. I think he had rolled it and jumped it and done all these different things. And then he put it up to this trailer here, this 30,000 pound gooseneck trailer with a truck and a bulldozer on it and proceeded to tow that around for a while. Then he shipped this thing off to Mohab and did all kinds of stuff and on four wheeler tracks that you wouldn't believe. And then finally he dropped it out of a helicopter and which finally managed to destroy this vehicle. They are indestructible. So ISIS uses Toyotas. Here you can see this picture actually prompted the U.S. government to investigate, well, how does ISIS manage to get their hands on all these Toyotas? Maybe the better question is, how do all the people that navigate the difficult environments in the Middle East manage to get their hands on Toyotas? So these pictures were taken from some uh, rather recent trips of mine. Uh, the vehicle you see here on the left with no license plate, 
That's a land cruiser that we were driving in Yemen. And on the bottom there, you can see another land cruiser that we're using to transport things throughout the trip. Uh, the vehicle that you see in the top there, that's also, that's a 1995 land cruiser. And I was driving around in that several weeks ago in Somalia. These places are very difficult to navigate. You need reliable vehicles that can uh, traverse very difficult terrains. And you will find that most cases... <laughs> People will drive, the ones that can afford to, will drive Land Cruisers, or they will drive some form of Toyota because they're just reliable. You can get parts. They work very well. What's quite surprising is when you ask, how did Toyota manage to achieve the quality that they have? Is it because they're using high levels of automation? And the answer is actually no. So while the rest of the automotive industry, such as Tesla, highly automated, right? So Elon Musk says that's the single biggest uh, advantage that Tesla has, competitive advantage is that they use robotics. Now, uh, Toyota is taking a different approach. And in an article by, uh, I think this is by Fast Company, and it was written back in 2017, but it's well worth a read. It's fascinating, uh, if not rather verbose, but it talks about quality at Toyota and that their automation ratio today uh, was back in 2017, is no higher than it was 15 years ago, and there weren't plans to change that. So they said, for at least the last 10 years, robots have been responsible for less than 8% of the work on Toyota's global assembly lines. Machines are good for repetitive things, says Toyota, but they can't improve their own efficiency or the quality of their work. Only people can do that. So Toyota believes that humans in the loop are critically important. So Toyota has actually conducted internal studies that compare the time it takes for people, machines to assemble a car over and over and human labor one. So when we think about automation, it's very important to realize that the human element of that is very important. I wanted to touch briefly on Japanese stocks. When you invest in firms like Fanuc or Yaskawa, you're going to run into some problems. The first being communication. These firms will produce all their collateral in Japanese. And if they do translate it, it's in what we call English. And it's very, very difficult to understand. Fanuc actually does a pretty decent job, as does Yaskawa, in terms of providing foreign investors some English materials. The other bit here to take note of is the foreign currency exposure. So Japanese yen right now in October of last year was at a 32-year low to the U.S. dollar. So when I was in Japan last, a dollar was roughly 100 yen. Today, a dollar is 130 yen. So now is a great time to visit Japan and purchase Japanese products. That should bode well for Japanese manufacturers that are exporting, right? Though that starts to get into uh, macroeconomics and it becomes all rather convoluted. But the point is that if you're going to buy shares in those firms and you're going to use yen to buy on those foreign exchanges, then that gives you some foreign currency diversification. And then you need to consider block trading. For whatever reason, Japanese firms only can be traded in blocks of 100 shares. That limits your ability to dollar cost average for your average retail investor. If a, if a share price is rather rich, then it becomes difficult because you have to buy in larger chunks. So just keep that in mind. Now, to conclude, when we look at industrial robotics, you know, planned obsolescence isn't going to work. So companies that build quality products will survive and thrive in this domain where corporations that look to replace humans with Industrial robotics will look for quality producers of products in the Japanese. And of course, the Swiss uh, do a great job when it comes to manufacturing quality stuff. Automotive is the first to go and the rest will follow. So we would expect that a good chunk of the global manufacturing industry will have industrial robotics enabled because that's the next step for companies to show efficiencies for shareholders. But automation won't solve all our problems as Toyota has showed us. So getting exposure to industrial robotics seems to make sense. I'm going to put a video up which talks about how we arrived at three these three companies. Before you watch that, please click the blue Nanolize logo right here on the right. Subscribe to our channel. Thanks for taking the time to watch this today.